Hi there, my name's Bruce Rain from Brankus Creations, and in this video I'm going to tear down and recap a Macintosh Portable. The Macintosh Portable wasn't a big success for Apple, however it has become one of the more collectible vintage Macs. But as with many computers of that vintage, they need to have their capacitors replaced if you want to keep them operational. This video describes the steps for disassembling your Macintosh Portable and removing the logic board, as well as going through the recapping process. This is the Macintosh Portable I'll be working on today. As you can see, it clearly has a few problems. Hopefully, the recap will fix it. Okay, so the first thing we need to do is remove the batteries. That's both the main battery and the battery backup. In order to do that, we're gonna to need to take off the back cover. So let's close the lid and let's spin it around for removal of the back cover. So here we have two buttons. Now the buttons are actually part of the base, not part of the cover. So when you're removing them, what you wanna do is you wanna press in and lift that up. And we wanna be super careful when we're doing this because the plastics on these things are incredibly brittle. Uh, every step of the way of this removal requires bending plastics. So uh, you have to just be super careful with everything you do. So you lift that up and as you can see, those buttons actually move these little hooks here. And so once we uh, get that cover off, we've then got access here to the hard drive, floppy drive, memory and batteries. Now this particular one doesn't actually have a hard drive in it, but if it had one, it would be right there. Okay, so the next thing we need to do is remove the battery. So we do that by pressing down on these two plastic tabs while pushing forward like that. And that cover just comes straight off. Uh, this is the main battery here. It's a sealed lead acid battery. This isn't the original battery. Uh, this is someone has actually made their own. So we're going to lift that out, put it to one side. And then we have the battery backup here. So this is the PRAM battery. It's a nine volt. We just need to unclip that and remove that as well. Uh, now that there's no more power, we can remove any uh, additional cards, RAM, ROM, PDS, whatever might be in these slots. So I've got a RAM expansion here. I'm going to just gently wiggle that out of the slot like that and put it to one side. For this next step, we want to remove the cover around the keyboard and trackpad here. And that is done by releasing two little latches underneath the case here. I found the best way to access those is to open the screen as far as it will go, then lift it up like this and work on it like that. So the main thing we need to focus on are these areas here. Now these would have had rubber feet in them originally, but unfortunately with this model, those the rubber feet have long gone. Uh, but if yours does have the rubber feet, they need to be removed to reveal these little holes here. The hole in the middle is where we're focused. And what we need to do is we need to get a very, very small flat-headed screwdriver, like a jeweler's type screwdriver, and poke it through the middle hole. And then that will allow us to push up the plastic to release the plastic cover on top of the keyboard. So we want to insert our small screwdriver in through this center hole, feed it in at this sort of angle, and then push and prise it upwards. And you'll see this side just pops out like that. Now we want to do it on the other side. So once again, we place it in up at that angle there and prise downwards and push and that will come out. So now that these two corner edges are popped up, the easiest thing to do now is to just put your fingers underneath very gently, work your way from the outside in and gently release that plastic. And then that will then just lift up and slide out like that. So the next thing we're gonna do is remove three cables, the display cable, the hard drive cable, and the floppy drive cable, and we'll be doing them in that order. And the display cable is nice and easy to remove because it has this little plastic loop on top. So you can just get your finger underneath that loop and just gently pull it straight upwards. And then we just wanna push that out of the way so that we can get to our hard drive cable. 
And the hard drive cable unfortunately doesn't have anything to grab hold of. So I've just got a pair of needle nose pliers and I'm just going to very, very gently grab it by the edge and lift up one side at a time and just carefully lift that cable up like that. And then we can pull him out of the way. And then last of all is the floppy drive cable. And thankfully this one's a lot easier because it's got a little loop on it. So you can just put your finger in there onto the loop and lift it upwards. And then we'll pull that out the back. For the next step, we're going to remove the keyboard and the trackpad. We start off by removing the cables. So they're nice and easy because they have these little plastic handles. So you just grab the plastic and pull straight up firmly and they will remove like that. Do the same on this side. Nice and firmly unplug that cable. And then we just push those cables out of the way. Now the next step we need to remove the trackpad and the keyboard and this is actually a really really tricky process and the reason is they're held in by these little plastic tabs here and what we have to do is we have to lift it up and then gently push these back one at a time and then work its way out as I mentioned before all of these plastics are brittle so you have to be super careful because it's very easy to snap one of these little tabs off we basically put our finger under here and we apply some upwards pressure and at the same time, we push this little plastic tab back until it gets past the plastic tab. And then we work our way along, pressing each plastic tab as we go, lifting the corner up. And then we get down to the last tab. If we have a little bit of trouble on that last tab, we just get a screwdriver in here, push down on the tab, and then lift that up. And then that is the keyboard. You can just lift the back up and then slide it backwards like that and the keyboard comes out and now the same for the trackpad we basically just need to apply some pressure at one side push these plastic tabs in until we can lift it up and out like that now this plastic divider can actually be moved from this location to this location which allows you to put the trackpad here and the keyboard there in case you're a left-handed person. Now we're gonna remove the display assembly and that's actually a lot easier than it might seem. This is the display clutch cover. So you need to grab this firmly and then you twist it while pulling and then twist it in the other direction also while pulling and then it will just come straight out. And now we need to do the same with the other side. Once again, grab it firmly, twist it while pulling, then twist it the other way, give it a wiggle, and that comes out. Now we need to remove this little piece of plastic here. This is actually holding the clutch into place. So if you just lift that straight upwards and do the same on the other side. Now, while holding the top of the display, you can slide that clutch out one side and slide the other clutch out the other side. And then that display comes off. Next, we're going to remove the speaker. So unplug it, and then gently bend this clip to one side, which will release the speaker. While we're here, we'll also disconnect the power cable. So next is the really fun part, and that's where we remove this entire subframe. So firstly, we'll remove the input cables. So the subframe is held in with three clips, one here, one here, and one here. These two can easily be accessed with your thumbs, whereas this one you're going to need a screwdriver for. So we'll start by applying some pressure with your thumb to this clip here which allows you to lift up this corner. And then I'm just going to place a little spudger underneath there to hold that up so that it doesn't fall back down again. Then we'll grab a screwdriver and we'll put it here into that little slot there and give it a bit of a twist where you can then lift that up. And then last of all, apply some pressure with your thumb there to that clip and then you can get that last one off. And then this whole piece 
comes out as one like that. So now that we have the subframe out, we're going to start the nail biting process of removing the logic board. So flip it over and we need to bend each of these plastic clips one at a time in order to get the board out. And we do it the same way that we did with the keyboard. You start at one end and just apply some pressure to the clip until you feel the board give, then to the next one, then to the next one, the next one, the next one, and that one, and then last of all is that one there, and here. And then the board just lifts up at an angle and then you can pull it out. And there you have the logic board. And then the next step is to start the recapping. And as with all of my recapping videos, there is a cheat sheet which you can download from my website. Uh, the links are in the description. Uh, this basically shows you the position of the capacitors, it shows you the polarity of those capacitors, and it shows you the voltage and capacitance ratings. There are also links on where you can buy these capacitors from. Now, the Macintosh Portable actually has three different types of capacitors that are going to need to be replaced. There are surface mount electrolytic, there are through hole radial electrolytic and there are axial electrolytic capacitors and they're all going to need to be replaced on this board. Now this particular board is actually in incredibly good condition. It's very, very clean and tidy. I think this computer has been very well stored throughout its life. However, if we have a look at it under the microscope, you'll see that even as clean as this one is, it still needs to be recapped. All right, so let's start with this little surface mount electrolytic capacitor here. Now, as you can see, there is some visible leakage around the outside of it. And you can actually see some darkening here of this trace. And that's from corrosion, early stage corrosion from the, uh, uh, the leakage from that capacitor. Uh, now let's jump across and have a look at a couple of these radial through hole electrolytic capacitors. As you can see, we've got really noticeable leakage here. Um, it's all very fluid there. Uh, and once again, that's just a sign that these capacitors really need to be changed as soon as possible. Now, one of the biggest challenges that we have with the Macintosh Portable is that it has some capacitors really, really close to plastic. So here is one of the IO ports of the Macintosh Portable. And if we move down just a small amount, you can see these surface mount electrolytic capacitors and they are really close. If I were to grab a soldering iron tip here and try and solder within here, I am going to touch that plastic and I'm going to melt it. So we have to be fairly creative with the way that we go in and replace these capacitors. Um, but the first thing we need to do is the first step of any recapping that I do is we need to get the old capacitors off and I'm going to start with all of the surface mount electrolytics and for that I use my hot air station. I always prefer to use a hot air station when I'm removing electrolytic capacitors, especially in a situation like this where we have all this plastic nearby. Um, now I'm going to be using heat shields to protect that plastic. Now my heat shields are basically blades from adjustable cutters such as this. You can extend the blade out and you can snap the end off it. And I really like those blades because you can snap them to different lengths. They're a very good size to use as a heat shield. So um, I am going to start off with these three capacitors here. Uh, and I am going to place uh, my heat shield between the plastic and those capacitors. Uh, and hopefully that will provide enough protection uh, that I can remove them without causing any meltage. Now I might just grab a little bit of Captan, Captan heat resistant tape, put it in between, uh, just add a little bit of extra protection there, but we definitely would not be wanting to do this without some, uh, some form of heat shield protection. So I grab my uh, hot air station, grab a pair of tweezers, I'm coming in with hot air from the left hand side, let's get some focus in there and apply some heat. The base of the capacitor starts to melt but that's all fine, I'm really not concerned about that. 
and just enough heat for that cap to come off. Now these capacitors are actually held on with uh, a uh, component adhesive that's what that white stuff is there um, so that just means they're a little bit harder to get off even when you melt the uh, melt the solder you still have to give them a pretty decent yank to get them off okay that's those three off uh, let's uh, assess the damage and see if we manage to do this without melting any plastic and they look absolutely pristine to me so that's fantastic now of course we now uh, see just how bad um, these uh, the leakage is on these capacitors you can see that um, I'm just going to remove this bit of adhesive there and I'll do the same with that I don't want that adhesive there this adhesive is quite tough uh, if if you have trouble removing it you just apply a little bit of heat to it really not much and it gets a little bit stickier a little bit softer and then you can just remove it there okay so um, yeah so those okay so those capacitors are now off um, I'm gonna have to inspect all of these traces around here to see if there's any damage but I think they'll probably be okay but we'll uh, have a look once we've had a chance to clean them all up okay so let's move on to removing the next capacitors now we've got these ones here up at the top of the board and they are tucked in um, next to quite a bit of plastic around them so I am going to once again try and place some heat shield protection in there maybe there yeah let's try there okay so now one of the things I also do is I use little springs like this little compression springs that I can then hook over my heat shields like that to make them stand up nice and easily so I'm just going to do that there so that they stay up and stay out of the way all right so once again I just need to get come at this at an angle where I'm going to do as little damage as possible with my hot air so I'm going to come at this pointing from the bottom upwards Whee! this is another uh, occasional side effect when removing these capacitors with hot air and that is they pop um, which is why if you are doing this without a microscope I would say it's very important for you to wear some eye protection um, because they uh, they will pop out and you don't want to end up with something in your eye and of course they will also scare you all right this one here is just on its own I'm not even going to bother with a heat shield for this one this is actually a 4.7 microfarad 25 volt there I haven't seen any other Macs that actually have this rating capacitor so uh, Macintosh portable is a little bit special like that. Off she comes. As you can see, I'm just going to get rid of that. As you can see here, we've got this mask coming away and we've actually got some browning of that copper and we will need to clean that up um, as part of, uh, of this recapping process. Get rid of any of that dark so we reveal nice clean copper and then I'm going to put some uh, uh, solder on top of that to uh, make sure that it doesn't corrode any further okay well, let's move along to a little cluster of three capacitors just here up in the corner of the board one two three uh, now once again with these there's not a whole lot of plastic around so I can probably get by without a heat shield um, and we'll just okay that's off see if I can get rid of there we go and get rid of the adhesive without doing any damage to the traces
Now I can smell while I'm removing these, I can smell that smell of leaky capacitors, which is not at all surprising. It's not a particularly pleasant smell and it's even more unpleasant when you hit it with hot air. Okay. All right. And that is, let me just double check on the cheat sheet. We have got eight, 11, a total of 11. Oh, I have missed two. And they are, the last two are just here. Again, next to one of these IO ports. So let's, once again, we'll grab some of this heat resistant captan tape and we'll put a little on this plastic. Just wrap it up there. Once again, just taking all precautions to try and prevent any melt, melting of that plastic. And we'll put in our heat shield. And then once again, let's hit it with some hot air. Whoop. And hope we don't melt anything. There's one. There's a pop. There's two. A little bit difficult to see, I do apologise. Okay, we've got more of the uh, adhesive there. I'll just hit this with a bit more heat. Okay, so I have removed all of the surface mount electrolytic capacitors and I don't see any melted plastic, so I'm feeling pretty good about that. Um, the next thing I'm going to do is remove the two axial capacitors. We've got one there and we have one here. Uh, and the way that I remove axial capacitors is I grab some cutters and I just snip and snip and then I leave these two little pieces of wire sticking straight up. And then I do the same for this one. Little snip, little snip, and then I've got these two wires sticking straight up. Now, to get those wires out, what I do, we'll jump across here to the uh, microscope and there's one of the wires right there. I'm gonna grab myself a pair of tweezers. I'm gonna grab a little bit of flux. Incredibly important uh, component of recapping is flux. And uh, if you're interested in finding out a little bit more about flux and what it does and why we use it, I have a learning to solder video, which goes in and demonstrates what flux does. And it also shows what it's like soldering without it. So you can actually see a comparison. So I'm gonna grab my soldering iron now and I am going to apply some heat to that little piece of uh, that little pin sticking out of the board and that will then just cause it to melt and then I can lift the pin off 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 sorry I'm having a little bit of trouble getting a good grip on this I think the pin might actually be bent on the other side of the board, which is making it a little bit harder to get out. Yeah, it is. As you can see, that pin was bent at an angle, so uh, trying to get that out was a little bit on the difficult side. Okay, let's now spin around and do the other pin, which is here. And I dare say I'm gonna have the same trouble with this one, because I, I reckon it's probably bent on the other side as well. Now I'm right next to plastic here, so I'm gonna be super careful. Oh, that one was not bent. That one came straight out. Super easy. Uh, the next thing we need to do is we need to clear out that hole so that we can actually have it uh, free of any solder for putting the new component in. And the way I do that is with uh, solder wick, which is also known as solder braid. Once again, there are links for buying this in the description. Uh, and it is basically just a copper mesh that has uh, flux in it and it draws solder away. It draws solder into the wick. And so that allows you to draw solder out of a hole such as this. I'm gonna just place it on top of the hole. I'm gonna put my soldering iron on top of that. 
and then I'm going to hope that it pulls that solder out. The moment it's being a little bit stubborn and that does happen uh, a lot of the time when you're trying to get solder out of a hole like this um, you uh, you just don't get enough heat um, and one of the ways that I get around that is to add more solder to it which seems a little bit counterintuitive um, but we'll put some of this newer solder in there like that and then we'll try again with the wick and we'll just hope that it all just comes out in one big go just like that okay so let's do the same on this one let's first of all see if we can get it out without adding any more solder we've certainly got a lot of it out yep that's through that's all the way through there so that one was nice and easy okay so let's try the next pin here so that's it there so once again, we're going to just add a little bit of flux to this. I'm using Amtec flux. Uh, once again, links in the description. Um, this is a very good flux to use. I highly recommend it. It is a no clean gel flux. Uh, so what that basically means is that even if you were to leave this flux on the board, it's not going to corrode the metal in time. It's still, I think, good practice to remove the uh, the flux to clean the board afterwards but the fact that it's no clean just simply means that if you do end up with a little bit of flux on the board it's not going to do any damage now this is another one where I, it feels like the pin is bent so i might even come at that from the other side that's okay now this one here i can actually just tell from uh from uh, applying some heat to it that this one i think is attached to a ground plane because a lot of that heat is being taken away. I'm applying heat to the pin and it's just not getting hot. And that's because the, uh, the ground plane is sucking all that heat away. So let's, and that is gonna make it hard to get the, uh, um, the solder out of the hole as well. But anyhow, we've got the pin out. Uh, now with this one, I'm just gonna have a quick look from underneath. And here's the pin from the other side and we can see that that pin is bent so if we pull it from this side it'll be a lot easier because it's just going to come straight out like that all right now time to see if we can get that solder out nice and easily um, and you never know until you try so once again we get some we get some solder wick and trim a little bit off that and then we'll just start on there and that one came out nice and easily very very clear this one as i say i will be surprised if this one is that easy but we can only hope keep trying hoping still got solder in there okay so that still hasn't come out we can Try and add some more solder as we did last time and see if that works. Failing that, we will uh, try and get it from the other side of the board. Yeah, I really don't think I'm going to get this just from one side. So let's flip him over to the other side. And here's where we're losing all the heat. As you can see, all of this light green here, that's all copper. And that's just sucking all the heat away. And that's why it's making it so hard to get all this solder hot enough to melt away. There we go. Now we've got that clear. So what we have now is not four nice clear holes ready for attaching our two new axial capacitors. Next thing we need to do is remove the radial capacitors. And that we need to do from the underside because the pins are through hole, they're on the other side of the board. So uh, let's start with this one here. And so we've basically got two pins, one there and one there. And we need now to 
desolder those. Now there are a couple of different ways you can do that when you're dealing with through hole. One of them is to use uh, a solder sucker, something along these lines. This is one where you basically prime it and then you press a button and it actually just sucks air through there. So you apply some heat with your soldering iron and then you suck the solder through here. There are also mechanical um, desoldering stations which actually uh, have a heated tip and a little motor and they actually suck solder up into them. They're obviously preferable to use, but they're quite expensive, especially for good ones. Um, I am going to be using this manual solder sucker to remove the solder, and I am going to be hopeful that that will be enough. We'll just have to wait and see. So we apply some heat. I've got some flux on there. I'll apply some heat to this solder, get it all nice and hot. I want that to be as hot as possible to make all of that solder liquid, and then try and suck some of that out of there. And as you can see, there's still quite a bit of solder left behind. Now I am going to bend this pin up because that will make it a lot easier for removal. Now let's try that other hole. Let's melt that. And that's a little bit better. I can definitely see quite a bit more of a gap there. Another thing you can do, and again, this doesn't always work with removing the, uh, the solder from these sorts of uh, through holes. You can get some solder wick and you put it up nice and close and you can try and draw all of that solder out into the solder wick. You need to be very careful with solder wick because if you heat it and then you let go of it so that it, uh, it cools, if it gets stuck to the board, uh, and then you tear it away. You can tear away a trace or a pad. And so you need to be really, really careful with the way that you use uh, solder wick. Uh, I highly recommend doing a bit of practicing, trying it out on boards that aren't important, uh, whether it be an old, an old VCR or an old toaster or something like that. Uh, play around uh, so that you, uh, you don't do any damage when it comes to working on your, uh, your prized boards. So, um, we still have quite a bit of solder here um, and I'm not sure of my chances of getting uh, that, uh, that component out. I'm going to add a little bit more solder and a little bit more flux and we'll just see if the introduction of some new solder might make it a little bit easier to remove all of the other stuff. So once again, apply some heat, get my solder sucker suck that through and we look about the same there. Let's get here. And of course the other thing we, we want to do is we want to make sure we don't do any damage. So I am going to now, um, holding the board uh, on the edge of the table, I'm going to actually put my hands onto this capacitor and I'm going to try and pull that down while applying some heat and just see if I can get that out. So I'll apply some heat to there and I'm just working it at working its way out there a bit at a time I can definitely feel it moving quite freely now and that's the capacitor out now so let's just check and make sure that there is uh, no damage these holes still look okay I'm just going to apply some solder wick here to just make sure I've got all the solder out, make it nice and easy for a new component to go in. So it's looking good. So that's the first one out. And as you can see, when it comes to removing these through hole capacitors, it's a lot harder than removing those surface mount. And so it does take a lot more time. So let's move on to the next one. And that is right here. And once again, we've got a lovely bent pin, which is, uh, is uh, a real pain. So I'm going to with this one, rather than using the solder sucker, I'm going to actually see if we have any more luck with the solder wick. I'm just going to trim some of this old stuff away. I reckon we're probably getting about the same amount of solder removal from the wick as we were from the solder sucker. And once again, just going to bend that pin up and that pin up. Just make it a little bit easier to get that out. Oh, and this one actually looks like he's coming free pretty easily. So that one. 
was a lot easier to remove. So there's the next one. So if we now have a look at this capacitor under the microscope, you can see all of that leaky liquid coming out the top. So definitely needing a replacement. All right, so let's move on to the next one. Okay, now it's time to clean up these surface mount electrolytic capacitor pads. Uh, and so we will start that once again with a little bit of flux. And then I'm going to introduce some new solder onto those pads. And I will then just very gently circulate the soldering iron tip. And we are basically trying to clean away as much gunk as possible using flux using heat and using new solder so that those pads come up looking like new let's move along to the next one let's get our new solder onto there you can see all that blackening on those pads we basically want to keep going here until that blackening is gone and although it may look like i am rubbing these pads i'm barely touching them it is basically my uh, soldering iron just hovering slightly above and then let's do the same here. Let's get that clean. All right. Okay, now we need to use some wick and remove all of that solder. And we want to basically reveal some nice shiny new pads that virtually look like new. It always seems very counterintuitive to add new solder just to take it away again. But that new solder really does help during the cleaning process. And then we basically just keep working away until these pads look like new. And once again, this is something where you need to be incredibly careful when you're working with solder wick. And you can actually see it there that this heat is making this pad wobble uh, and that's what we need to be careful of we don't want to be removing any pads here uh, so as I say super 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 gentle um, so that we don't have to do any pad repair as well as the replacement of the caps okay all right, now I am going to grab a scalpel. I use surgical scalpels with a slightly curved blade. Once again, you will find links in the description and I use them to scrape away any nasty gunk from these pads. Uh, this one here looks particularly bad and this is the one that was wobbling. And it's a shame, and obviously that wobble is, is occurring because um, this particular pad is in such bad condition. Um, but it's still, we still have to get it clean. We just have to be a lot more careful. So I'm just going to grab this Q-tip with some isopropyl alcohol. We are going to rub around here until we get rid of all of this old flux and brown stuff. We want these to come up looking sparkling new, and that allows us to go in and inspect all of the surrounding traces and see whether there's any further work that needs to be done whether there might be some trace damage or some trace corrosion uh, that we need to repair uh, before we put new capacitors on there so let's grab another one Okay, so I can see there's a little bit of blackening here, so I'm going to scrape that away until I reveal nice clean copper. Uh, there's a little bit of blackening around here and here and here. Just need to make sure that all of these traces look shiny and new.
I don't actually see any brakes, which is great. It uh, means we don't have to uh, do any actual repairs with these. But I am now just going to coat this exposed copper with some solder. So that is a very, very precarious pad there. Uh, I'm going to need to be super, super careful when I actually uh, put the new component on. And then we need to continue that cleaning for the other surface mount capacitors as well. So let's have a look at these ones, once again, these ones are nice and close to the plastic. These don't appear to be as bad as those other ones, so these ones will hopefully be a little bit easier. I don't think we have any of the trace rot like we did on the other ones. So let's apply some new solder and some flux and just keep working around until we see all the black stuff go. And do the same here. And then we have these lovely shiny looking pads. And of course, as I mentioned, if they don't look shiny and new, you're not finished. You have to get them clean before you can move on to the next step. Now, one of the things that I'm going to do before I put new components on is I am going to mask out some of these exposed uh, traces. It's not good to have exposed traces. Um, and in particular, when I, when I put these new components on, I don't want to accidentally create a short by um, having a, uh, one of the new components pins uh, accidentally touching one of these nearby traces. So I just avoid any of that by coating it with UV solder mask. Now, once again, UV solder mask, you will find links to that in the description. Uh, it is basically a uh, liquid that you paint onto the surface. It must be clean. So I'm now cleaning it with a uh, tissue and some isopropyl alcohol. So we want to make sure they're not all sticky. They've got to be nice and clean. And then I'm going to paint over these exposed traces. And the UV solder mask can then just be dried under a UV light or sunlight. Um, quite a lot of UV in sunlight so you can always just dry them out outside. So I've got a very fine uh, paintbrush and I am just going to go through and paint over all of these exposed traces. Got quite a bit here, a bit more than I need but I'll try and spread it out.
Okay, so I've applied the UV solder mask to all of those exposed traces, and now I'm going to let them dry under a UV lamp, and then we can continue with the recapping. Okay, so the UV solder mask has dried and I'm ready to put the new capacitors on. This is now a great opportunity to show you why the UV solder mask is important. So let's just have a look here under the microscope. Here you can see that I have a surface mount electrolytic capacitor and on the right I have a tantalum capacitor. Now these boards were originally made for surface mount electrolytic. Now if I grab this capacitor and I try and carefully spin it over, you will see that the pins are very narrow, as are the pins on the board. If we zoom down here and have a look at that, you can see that these pins are long and thin. But now let's get this tantalum capacitor and spin that over. And you can see that the pads here are actually, the pins, sorry, are really wide like that. Now, when it comes time for us to put this new tantalum capacitor in place of an old electrolytic, you can see that that pad hangs over the edge a bit. And in particular with the Macintosh portable board, you can see there are traces that run very, very close to the pad. And so you run the risk of when you put that capacitor down, having part of that pin touching one of these exposed traces on the side. And so I need to avoid that, make sure I don't end up with any uh, unexpected uh, sh uh, short circuits. So uh, that's why I use all this UV solder mask, which as you can see now that it's dry, has gone quite hard and it provides an insulation layer there. So let's begin the replacement of the old capacitors with the new ones. And as I mentioned, I'm replacing the old electrolytics with tantalum capacitors as they are very reliable. Um, and they won't leak in the future. So, as with uh, all of the recapping jobs that I do, I uh, start off with some flux on the pads, all fresh and clean now, ready for new capacitors to go on. So I'm just gonna put some there. And then I'm just going to spin this board around. Uh, let's see what's the best angle. I think probably like that and tantalum capacitors have a stripe on the positive side. So we can see we've got a little plus sign there and we've got a stripe there. Just keeping in mind, of course, that electrolytic capacitors have a stripe on the negative side. Okay, so we've got our flux in, uh, in place and then I've just grabbed a little bit of solder and melted it onto the tip of my iron. Then I'm gonna hold this in position best as I can, and then apply some solder here. And that's that. Then I press that down to make sure it's nice and flush. And there's a nice clean joint there. Then I do the other side. I'm gonna to have to spin it around at a different angle here because I am right-handed. And once again, we'll just get some solder onto the tip of my soldering iron there. Hold this down with the tweezers and just make a nice neat and tidy joint there. As you can see, those joins look nice and smooth. And the main reason for that is uh, because we have flux number one and because we have prepared these pads so that they're all nice and clean. Okay, so now that was a 47 microfarad uh, 16 volt capacitor. Uh, there are four of those on this board and I know where they all go because I have my cheat sheet. So, uh, that has told me that's where that capacitor goes. So let's uh, start again. We'll get some flux on there and we'll do the same with this one while we're at it. Get a bit of flux on there and we'll drop a, drop a new capacitor onto there. And once again, grab a little bit of solder onto the tip of the iron hold the capacitor still with tweezers. Tweezers are an incredibly important part of doing these, so make sure you have a good set of fine point tweezers. There are links in the description. So let's just position that there. Try and get it as straight as possible. Just think like a, like a little bit more solder on that one, so. 
There we go. Whoop, and I've moved it. I'm unfortunately coming at this at a really difficult angle, and that's to do with the fact that this board is so big. Um, when you're working with a smaller board, you can just sort of spin them around and position them any way you want. But a big board like this, I'm limited to the way I can actually um, keep it on my desk without having parts of it hanging off and falling off. All right, there we go. Okay, so that's two. And then we'll do the third. And once again, we need the stripe to the positive end. If you're ever in an instance where the plus, the little uh, silk screening of the little plus has disappeared off the board, uh, another way you can tell which way is positive is by looking at these little beveled edges on the screen printing there. You can see there's these ones are square edges on the bottom and we've got beveled edges there at the positive side. So once again, we'll get some solder onto the tip. We will grab our capacitor, put it in place, hold it in place as best we can, and here we go. It's a nice tidy join there, and then same for this one. Right. Okay. So there we go. We've got three capacitors on there. Now, I mentioned before that we have some real challenges with this board, and that is that we have some capacitors that are so close to the plastic, it actually makes it really, really difficult uh, for me to uh, get a soldering line down into the little gap. So what I'm actually going to do, we're going to jump across now to one of those locations, and we can see that here. There is the I.O. port, and here are our three capacitors. Now, I'm going to do these in a slightly different way. The first way I showed you there, those first three, that's how I would normally put these capacitors on. Um, this time, I'm actually going to do something a little bit different. Uh, and so what I'll do is I'll start off with some flux, like that, and... I'll do it for all of these. Just doing it for the pad that is closest to the um, uh, to the plastic, and I'm going to just put a little bit of solder on this, just the one side. So I want to get a nice little dob of solder there, like that. Let's get a little bit more flux onto this one, so I can get a neater shape. There we go, that's what I want. Now, keeping in mind, of course, this one here is the one that was wobbling before. So again, I'm being super, super careful. All right, so once again, I'm gonna to refer to my cheat sheet and I'm gonna start off with the first one, which is a one microfarad 50 volt. So I'm gonna grab one of those out of my little supply here and making sure that I've got lots and lots of flux on there. And what I'm actually going to do is I'm going to use my hot air station and I'm going to uh, heat this solder and then melt the uh, melt it down so that the uh, capacitor can then just sort of sit on that solder without me having to apply a soldering iron. Now, because I'm using hot air, I'm going to have to use my heat shield. So once again, I'm going to grab some of this Captain tape. Uh, there are links in the description if you want to buy Captain tape. I'm going to wrap that around the plastic. Just provide some extra protection there. Then I'm going to grab one of my heat shields and I'm going to actually I'll grab a slightly longer one here and I'm just going to slot that in there if I can having trouble getting that staying exactly where I want so let's just do that all right I might just apply a little bit of tape to hold this one in I want this uh, metal sitting as flush with that, uh, that plastic as I can, so that I've got as much room as possible for my, uh, for my capacitor. Okay, 
So there we have it. I've got my heat shield sitting in between the plastic and the capacitor. And then I'm going to grab this capacitor with my tweezers, place it there like that. And then what I'm going to do is I'm going to try and apply some heat here as carefully as I can. One of the things I really don't like about um, tantalum capacitors is when you hit them with hot air, they do have a tendency to go brown. So I'm trying to limit the amount of heat that I apply to it so that it doesn't go brown. But I can see now that that is firmly secured at one side. Now I'm going to secure it from the other side so that it's on nice and strong now. And that's our first capacitor in position. And let's now move on to the next one. I just noticed there's a little solder ball here. I'm going to just get that out of the way. Okay, so once again, this is the one with the really dodgy pad. So I've got to be super, super careful with this one. Okay, so let's grab the replacement capacitor. We're gonna put that in position there. I'm going to Hold that down while I apply some heat. Yep, and that is on. So then let's secure the other side. Yep. We don't have very much pad here on this side so I've just got to do the best I can okay I just want to come at this with a little bit more heat I do have some concerns that that's not there we go okay and then we have the last one and the last one is one of our one of our 47 microfarad 16 volts so I'll just grab one of those once again apply a big glob of flux there cap in place and then apply some heat okay I could feel that solar melt it stopped rocking it was rocking on that little mound of solder before and then I could feel it go flat. So there, that's secure there. And then we'll just do the same on the other end. We'll apply some solder and get it locked into position. Okay. Now, the moment of truth. Let's remove our heat shield and see what the state of the plastic is. And we are looking pretty good. Now, I do have a little solder ball down there that I'm not too fond of. Uh, and that one doesn't look too crash hot either. Let's just have a look. That's okay. Yep. Look, at the end of the day, that is on. It's secure. It may not look absolutely 
you know, beautiful and spectacular and pretty. It's not necessarily a join that I would normally be content with, um, but it, uh, it has joined, um, it is secure, and we didn't melt any plastic. So I think uh, under the circumstances when dealing with this particular situation with um, a, you know sort of such a small amount of space between the capacitor and the plastic I think we just have to uh, uh, be happy enough with what we get. Okay so I've finished replacing all 11 surface mount electrolytic capacitors. What I'm going to do now is I'm going to put the board into the ultrasonic cleaner get it all cleaned before I put on the through hole and axial capacitors. So the logic board is now clean and dry. All that remains is to put in the through hole electrolytic capacitors and the axial electrolytic capacitors. Now the reason why I cleaned this before putting those other capacitors on is because my ultrasonic cleaner sometimes discolors the aluminium on the electrolytic capacitors. And although it doesn't do them any harm, I don't like the look of it. So uh, I wanted to uh, clean it before I put those capacitors on. The other is that when I'm putting in through hole capacitors, I don't need to use much flux. So it generally doesn't need cleaning afterwards. So let's start with our axial capacitors. Now I've got two 470 25 volt axial capacitors here. Uh, so let's put them in place on the board and then we'll solder them in. So we've got one that goes here. Uh, the capacitor has the uh, line indicating the negative. So we'll put that in the opposite spot to the little positive. Put that in there. And then just give these pins a little bit of a bend underneath, just so that the capacitor doesn't fall out. And then we've got the other one over here. Once again, the negative is pointing that way. And And then we'll just bend those pins and then we just need to solder those into position. So there's the first pin. Let's get some heat on there and some solder. And that's the first pin soldered. And we'll move to the next one. That's that. And this one. And then across to this one. Okay. Oh, sorry about the lack of focus there. And then we're just going to grab our cutters and snip off the uh, excess of the pins. There and there. And there and there. Okay, so that is our two axial capacitors in position. So the next thing we need to do is put our through hole capacitors in. We have of those, we've got uh, four 100 microfarad 25 and one 220 microfarad farad 25. So let's start with the one 220 microfarad 25 volt. My apologies for the bird noises in the background if you can hear them. Some rather noisy sulfur crested cockatoos there. Okay, so the 200, 220 microfarad 25 volt lives right here. Uh, once again, there is a stripe indicating the negative and we have a little plus showing where the positives is. So let's just put those in there and spin the board over. Give those pins a bit of a bend just again so they don't fall out. And then I'll get that under the microscope there. And what I generally like to do when I am uh, working with uh, uh, through hole capacitors, I usually just get solder onto one like that then I slip my hand underneath the board and I apply some pressure while melting the solder again and that allows me to just push down on that capacitor and make sure it's sitting perfectly flush on the board okay and then I can apply solder to the second hole There we 
go. And once again, we'll grab our cutters and just snip off the excess. So there we go. And then last of all, we've got our four 100 microfarad at 25 volt. And uh, they basically go wherever there is a gap left. So we've got two that live down here. Once again, making sure that the stripe goes onto the negative side, like that. And give those pins a bit of a bend so they don't fall out. And then we have another one, two, another two. So we have one that lives just here. And I will put the negative where the negative is supposed to be and give those pins a bit of a bend on the other side so they don't fall out and last of all negative oh got that around wrong the wrong way so there we go and then we bend the pins on the other side then once again uh, i do the same with these i just apply some solder to one side that I'll do the same with this other one that's right next door and then get the uh, hand under there and give it a bit of a push while melting the solder and then just make sure we get that cap nice and flush and then we'll do the same on this one just get our hand on the cap. Oh, oh, I missed it. Where is it? There it is. Sorry, I didn't have my hand on it. There we go. Apply the pressure to the cap. Make sure it's sitting flush with the board. Okay, and then we can go back to uh, putting solder on the second pin. Is that one on there? And I think I just like to clean up this joint a little bit too. Great. Now back to this one. Gonna put that there. I think I might just get a little bit of solder onto that bit of exposed copper there as well. Just to make sure that we don't get any corrosion in the future. So that's that. And then we'll just do the old snip again. Snip. Snip, snip, snip. All right, and then we have our last two here. Same process. Solder, solder. Then we lift up. pressure from the other side so that the uh, capacitor is sitting flush. Same for this one. There we go. And then we can come down back down here and solder the second pin. Just like that and like that. Okay. Then once again we have our excess that needs to be removed okay now i'll just be able to clean up any of this little excess uh, flux here with toothbrush and a bit of isopropyl alcohol uh, but that is basically it for the recapping so we have replaced 11 surface mount electrolytic capacitors with tantalum we've replaced two axial electrolytic capacitors and we've replaced five through hole radial electrolytic capacitors and so now the next thing we need to do is to quickly test it and make sure that it chimes before putting the whole thing back together again. Um, okay, so the way I'm gonna do that is I have a bench power supply here and I've got it on about six and a half volts. I'm going to use the uh, positive for these top two pins here and negative for these bottom two pins here. Uh, let's get that in there. Come on, in you get. There we go. Okay, 
Now, the one thing you don't want to do with uh, a portable is test it using the external power supply. They don't like to be run just with the external power supply uh, and no battery, so I'm actually going to replicate as if there was a battery connected to this rather than using the external power supply. Um, then I need to get the speaker so that I can tell whether it uh, goes ding. So we'll just uh, connect that up here now. And then I need to uh, replicate uh, as if I had a keyboard connected because obviously pressing a key on the keyboard is what starts it up. So let's give it some power. As I say, I've got this set on six and a half volts and it's drawing about 0.081 amps at the moment. Um, and then I'm actually just going to short a couple of pins together here on the, uh, uh, the keyboard uh, connector. And it's just these two here. And there we have a chime. Uh, and so that uh, is sounding pretty good to me. That uh, suggests to me that that recapping was successful. So I'm gonna put it all back together now and check and see uh, that it all does work. Okay, the Mac Portable is back together and we're going to attempt to boot it into system 7.1. We have the happy Mac face. And welcome to Macintosh. And there's the backlight. And that appears to be working well. Let's go to about this Macintosh and we've got five megabytes of RAM. That's one megabyte on board plus a four megabyte expansion. From a performance perspective, I'd probably go with system 6.08 or 701, but you can take the portable right up to system 7.5.5. Okay, that's all looking good here. I do hope you enjoyed this video and thanks for watching.